friends. I just press the let's go live a button, which means we got to wait for the stream to fire up all across the fruited plain of the internet. Before we can go ahead and get started, we got to make sure the tubes are connected. Sometimes they don't connect, but it looks like today is a great success. That's tremendous. That means we can go ahead and get started. So let's do it, shall we? Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live, the show that spotlights misconduct involving police, prosecutors, and politicians. My name is Robert Govea. I am a criminal defense attorney, and today we're talking about some Trump trials. We got Donald Trump in the January 6th case in Washington, D.C., has submitted two replies on two different motions that we're covering, and we're very excited about these rulings because we see that there are some pretty serious issues with Jack Smith's case. And so Donald Trump originally filed a motion to strike the inflammatory language out of the indictment. The indictment really had a lot of colorful language in there, like Donald Trump's an insurrectionist, and he's responsible for the end of democracy, and blah, 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 all types of, you know, Liz Cheney, Adam Kinzinger, Jack Smith type of nonsense. But the problem with all of that is they didn't charge him with crimes for that, right? If he's an insurrectionist, we have a statute for insurrection. They could have charged him, but they didn't do it. And so they're saying, let's strike all that language out. Right? If it doesn't apply to an actual criminal charge, all it's meant to do is just inflame things. And it's going to be going in front of a jury. And it's really unnecessary in this case. So it should be stricken. Jack Smith responded to it and said, well, you know, it's kind of the totality of everything. And then Trump issued a reply. So we'll go through that and see what Trump's defense had to say. And they're also issuing their final response, asking the court to stay this case, really to put a limit on it, while some of these other issues are pending at the Court of Appeals. So Donald Trump is saying, we have presidential immunity here, okay? You can't charge me for this type of stuff. And Judge Chutkin is saying, well, we're going through trial anyways. And so Trump is saying, stop the proceedings, essentially, until we get some clarity from the Court of Appeals. And so we'll go through all that in the very first segment. Then we're going to see what's going on with Big Fanny and the case out there in Rico in Georgia. It's the Rico case involving Donald Trump. And we got two updates here. First of all, yesterday on the show, if you missed that, what we did is we talked about the protective order hearing that was taking place after those leaked videos came out with Jenna Ellis and Sidney Powell. And uh, Fanny kind of hit the panic button on that one. She said, we got to have an emergency hearing on here. We need a protective order. And we spent a good portion of the show listening to the judge, Judge McAfee, it walking us through what the protective order looked like. And then we heard different objections from the various parties involved in the case. And of course, the judge said, I'll take this all under advisement. I'll review it and I will then issue a ruling. He has done that. And so he did grant the protective order and we'll go through some of the details in there. It's basically what we expect. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. But this is the bigger issue, okay? This is a co-defendant in the RICO case. This guy's name is Harrison Floyd. We've talked about him before. He was the one guy who was actually held in custody, right? He showed up. He said, I don't, you know, I have an, I don't have an attorney. I don't, know, you know, I don't know how to do any of this stuff. And the judge says, well, you, you're hold, held on bond then. And they held him in jail. Really, really the only uh, co-defendant in this entire case, who I think has served even a day of jail. And so he has been posting on the social media platforms, on X in particular, and Fanny says that those posts amount to witness tampering, right? Some sort of interference or obstruction or something enough to revoke his bond saying that, you know, he's out, he posted bond and he's supposed to be a good boy when you're out on bond and he's not being a good boy. And so he's got to go back into jail is what Fanny's essentially saying here. And so we're going to see this motion to revoke his bond, right? Floyd's bond is being revoked. She wants to put him back in jail. So we'll see what that looks like, go through it. And then of course the judge has already scheduled a hearing on this. So I think next week, Tuesday, we've got a hearing on this thing and Fanny is uh, making him appear. And you know, I don't know what's, I don't know what her problem is with, with this guy. I don't know if it's a racial thing or what the problem is, but uh, you know, he's the only guy who's been in jail and I don't know why she wants to put him back in jail, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to it. And then lastly, We'll talk about what, hap what happened today, just fresh out of the oven, man. We, we love the news when it's fresh. This one came out, Angeron and his gag order have been stayed. And of course, Angeron is probably very unhappy about that because the gag order was meant to stop us talking about his Greenfield, his GF called Allison, 
who sits right next to him and says, you're doing a great job, Judge, and passes him little love notes there on the bench, which is strange. You can see this is her laptop right there. I should have included the full photo here. But that's Angeron. And he gagged everybody from talking about this. Well, guess what happened? There was something interesting that took place today. Nobody was really expect expecting it. But this guy, Frank G. Runyon, was over there in court. And apparently in the Court of Appeals... Trump filed a, some sort of a filing, a claim, a lawsuit, some sort of application, a petition, something. And there was kind of a hearing that took place today. There was an actual hearing and a federal, I'm sorry, a court of appeals judge in New York has said that the gag order is now stayed. In fact, you can see this is what it looks like right here. And the judge signed off on this court attorney uh, here, justice here, considering the constitutional issues here, an interim stay is granted, right? So the gag order is stayed. And Donald Trump has responded ever so slightly to that. And by the time we get to this segment, we'll see if there's anything more from him. So as you can see, my friends, we've got a lot to get to today. We're grateful that you are here and joining us and with us today. I've got a quick uh, 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 housekeeping note. So uh, tomorrow we're going to be doing a live show. If everything goes according to plan and there's something to talk about between now and tomorrow, we're going to be doing an early show tomorrow. I've got a three-day event that I'm heading out the door for uh, as soon as we're done in the morning. And so we'll see if there's anything percolating in the news, but my intention is to do a live stream tomorrow at about 9 a.m. Eastern time. 9 a.m. Eastern time is what I'm thinking. So that's going to be a little earlier than usual, and we'll see if there's anything to talk about. Otherwise, we'll just be a little casual stream, but we'll say what's up. We'll be here, so make sure you're subscribed, and we'll get another show just right after this one kind of lined up. So that is happening tomorrow, and uh, we'll see you then. Now, before we get into... The actual meat and potatoes on the day. We've got to say hello to our friends at Field of Greens. And my friends, it is time. You're going to notice this one's a little extra special today. We've talked a lot about our friends over at Field of Greens and the importance of eating vegetables. But this one is a little bit different. So keep those ears perked because it is time for Black Friday, woo! The sale is on and it is incredible over with our friends at Field of Greens. And normally you're used to using a different promo code, but forget about that. Now we're gonna use promo code VIP and that's gonna get you 30% off when you use their code over at fieldofgreens.com. And of course, we love Field of Greens here. I love Field of Greens. I know I've used it, you've used it. We've seen many incredible results here. Things like more energy throughout the day, skin's looking healthier, Helps with things like digestion, stomach feels like it's a little bit more settled, hair, nails, things grow faster, look a little bit healthier, a little bit fresher, and just this overall feeling of health, kind of a little bit more pep in the step, as it were. And so I promise now, this is going to be one of the best things that you add to your life for better health, because the vegetables want to be eaten, and this is the time to save. Don't miss this massive sale. It's Black Friday. Get up to 30% off your order. Easy visit fieldofgreens.com. And don't forget to enter code VIP. VIP is the code. And that way you can save that 30% off. It's fieldofgreens.com. Very easy to go there, fieldofgreens.com. And it's great stuff. Of course, I've got mine and it is good. It tastes good. You can even add a little sparkling water in there. Just don't make sure the shaker explodes on you. When you do that, happens some, from time to time. But check them out, fieldofgreens.com. And don't forget to use code VIP. And, and V says it, it tastes great in kombucha. Pfft, see, there's all sorts of uses for it. So check them out, Field of Greens. Now, we also want to invite you to check out our website, robertgovea.com, where all the mind map stuff, all the PDFs, everything we're about to go through is available there. So if you want to go back through the documents, you know, where do I find those documents? robertgovea.com is the place. And Membos, stick around. We're doing our members only after party today after the show at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. We do Saturday streams as well. So we'll do one early this Saturday because of the event. <laughs> and so we've got, we're gonna check that out. Uh, check us out, watchingthewatchers.locals.com. All right, now without any further ado, let's get, let's get to it, Rob. Let's get to the business. Okay, we're doing it. Now here is where we're gonna get started. Trump's defense files their final reply in the motion to strike the inflammatory language out of Jack Smith's indictment. Jack Smith is using a lot of bravado in this indictment. He's saying Trump is a bunch of things, like an insurrectionist and trying to undermine democracy and all the things. Well, Jack, there are criminal charges that you could have alleged if he actually did those things. 
and you didn't. You could have charged him with insurrection, but you didn't. If you would have charged him with insurrection, well, maybe you should have then done that and then used the insurrectionary language to support the charge. But since there's no charge, why do you need the language? So Trump has tried to get this judge, Judge Chutkin, to cross it out, get it out of there, because we don't want this inflammatory language going in front of a jury. We just want them to hear the facts. We don't need all the opining from Jack Smith. And so we're going to go through that filing. We're also going to take a look at another motion from Trump saying, Judge Chetkin, it is appropriate now for you to stay this case. Okay, there's no reason to continue prosecuting this until we get a resolution from the Court of Appeals about presidential immunity, executive branch immunity, and saying until that is resolved, this is all supposed to be just on hiatus. And so we'll see what Trump said there. But I want to share with you just briefly the court docket. This, of course, is the January 6th docket. And it is getting a little bit busier because we're going to start jury selection in February of 24 with trial in March. And you can see these are the two filings we'll be taking a look at entered November 15th. And there's a bunch of other stuff going on. So the judge has said that there will be additional replies due and there are additional extensions of time. So we've got here, November 22nd will be another deadline and there will be more deadlines for more responses to more Trump motions to dismiss. And just for context, we're also expecting a similar slew of motions in the Florida case when the time comes. So this is what it looks like over in Shutkin's courtroom. This is Donald Trump's defense team writing, sending this into the court. We've got a lot of excerpts. This is from our friends, John Loro and Todd Blanche, as per usual on this case. They say, Judge Chutkin, the prosecution, Jack Smith, falsely asserts that President Trump is, quote, responsible for the events at the Capitol on January 6th. Sounds like that's a pretty hefty allegation there, Jack. Can you prove that? However, the indictment does not charge President Trump with causing or participating in those events, nor could it as not a shred of evidence suggests that President Trump called for any violence or asked anyone to enter the Capitol unlawfully. In fact, President Trump clearly and repeatedly called for, quote, peaceful and patriotic assembly, consistent with the finest ideals of our country. And President Trump also authorized over 10,000 National Guard troops, in fact, to prevent violence on January 6, protection that was denied by Democrat Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, and Democrat Mayor Muriel Bowser of Washington, D.C., letters and evidence we've seen here from Stephen Sund, Capitol Hill Chief of Police, former fired by Nancy Pelosi after he knew what was going on, and Mayor Muriel Bowser declined the National Guard in a letter that we've talked about here and reviewed many times. Thus, even these transparently partisan prosecutors could not obtain an indictment on that basis. So stop calling him an insurrectionist and blaming him for that stuff. Now, they say the prosecution, Jack Smith and the deranged thugs at the DOJ, they now seek to try President Trump for crimes that the grand jury never even charged based on actions that President Trump did not take in a place he never was on January 6th by people he never directed and opposite to actions he actually did take and statements he actually made. All with the goal of inflaming and prejudicing the jury. Now, the prosecution, they say, Your Honor, may not do, though. So, allegation that third parties allegedly acted improperly, other people, not Trump, will only serve to inflame and to prejudice the jury and do not belong in the indictment against Trump. The court should strike them from the record. They say that President Trump also intends to move in limine, so before the trial, a motion to limit to uh, prescribe certain evidence to preclude evidence and it's preliminary motion, right? It's before the trial starts. We're going to move, move in limine to preclude evidence, to keep it out, relating to the challenged allegations. Now, the prosecution's opposition has previewed at least one basis for that motion, should it be necessary. And for instance, they say, Jack Smith claims that protesters were, quote, extraordinarily violent and destructive. Now, even if that is marginally relevant, which they say it is emphatically not, the danger of unfair prejudice and confusing the issues or misleading the jury would far outweigh any probative value of that statement. And this is an important concept in the law, right? We, we don't want to mash together a bunch of, bunch of issues. It's very difficult. In fact, one of the things that you do in law school is they teach you to spot the issues and, and tease out the issues, right? It's like one of the most difficult things for people to learn is what are all of the issues? 
You don't want to just presume you know what the issues are. It's called issue spotting. You have to spot them, pull them out, do the analysis on every issue. And sometimes what looks like a simple fact pattern, you know, it's like this guy's mad at this guy. A is mad at B over a contract with C. And you go, no, 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 that's way more complicated than that, right? There's 30 different issues with that guy's mother and sister and brother and 30 contracts and this one. It's complicated. So here they're saying, right, Your Honor, they're, they charged him with specific conduct in the indictment and they alleged the con that this is the law that was violated. And this is the conduct that applies to the law that shows it was violated. Well, when they add in a bunch of superfluous, unnecessary stuff, it literally violates the rules. There's a rule, federal rules of evidence, 403. It says that it, this is going to cause unfair prejudice by calling him an insurrectionist, 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 confusing the issues. He's not on trial for insurrection. He's not mis, you know, this is misleading the jury. You got a bunch of DC jurors who are going to go, what? Insurrection? They say it would far outweigh any probative value. And so the fact that the prosecution even suggest that such inflammatory claims could be appropriate, it only underscores the unfair and the malicious way that Jack Smith is pursuing this case on behalf of the Biden administration against its leading political opponent, President Trump. All absolutely true, right? If you're a legitimate prosecutor who is trying to uphold the law and be even keeled here without bias and without partisanship, you don't add in a bunch of additional language. Your case is strong. You know what it looks like. Like, for example, in a DUI case, okay, if you've ever you know, known anybody who's been charged with a DUI, right, the, the, the charging document is just the document, just says DUI, right, and the report will blame, will, will explain the case. Police report might say, this person was driving like a maniac and all that stuff. That's evidence from you know, a witness, but it's not in the charge. If it's in the charge, then they charge it. That's reckless endangerment, right, because this person was driving. So you charge it and then prove it. But you don't say like, you know, this scumbag, uh, 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 you know, in the criminal complaint, you, you put the charges there and then prove the charges. You can't add in a bunch of stuff. So they say Biden is now, right, a, a normal prosecutor would know this. A no, and normal prosecutors do. They don't do this. And it serves to prove what a deranged thug Jack Smith and his prosecutors are. Now, here they, here's the background. They say, Your Honor, on January 6th, President Trump was there. In fact, he spoke to a crowd of peaceful supporters that were gathered at the White House Ellipse, about two miles from the Capitol. And during his speech, President Trump acknowledged that after he was finished speaking, some members of the crowd would walk to the Capitol to, quote, cheer on our brave senators and congressmen and women and, quote, Trump, peacefully and patriotically make their voices heard. They have this in a block quote from Trump saying the following. Anyone you want, but I think right here, we're going to walk to the Capitol, and here's Trump, and we're going to cheer on our brave senators and congressmen and women, and we're probably not going to be cheering so much for some of them. Now, I know that everyone here will soon be marching over to the Capitol building to peacefully and patriotically make your voices heard. And like for the lefty, that's like code. That's like insurrection code. That means like pillage and plunder. Ah, so we're going to, says Trump, we're going to walk down Pennsylvania Ave. I love Pennsylvania Ave, says, says Trump, Best Avenue. And we're going to go to the Capitol and we're going to try and give. The Democrats are hopeless. They never vote for anything, not even one vote. But we're going to try to give our Republicans the weak ones because the strong ones don't need any of our help. Saying we're going to try to give them the kind of pride and the kind of boldness that they need to take back our country. That's from Trump's statement. And NPR cited that. It's on their record, peacefully and patriotically. They charged him for it. Now, President Trump made clear that he expected the electoral certification proceedings to take place. He also said that with vice president and every congressperson and senator exercising their duties of their offices. Here's what he said. In other words, he did not encourage anybody to break up this counting. He expected it to, be, to go on because he wanted Mike Pence to do something differently. He said, and Mike Pence is going to have to come through with us. And if he doesn't, right, meaning that you are presuming that it happens, that the count happens, if he doesn't, not like Trump is saying, I'm going to stop him, that will be a sad day for our country because you're sworn to uphold the Constitution. And today we see a very important event, though, Trump says, because right over there, right there, we see the event going to take place. And I'm going to be watching because history is going to be made. We're going to see whether or not we have great and courageous leaders or whether or not we have leaders that should be ashamed of themselves throughout history, throughout eternity, they'll be ashamed. And you know what? If they do the wrong thing, 
We should never, ever forget that they did. Never forget. We should never, ever forget. It sounds like Trump is, is presuming that it's going to be done, right? If they do the wrong thing, not saying we're going to insurrect the Capitol and take over the country. So President Trump also repeatedly opposed the destruction of monuments and other symbols of American democracy. And he referenced stiff criminal penalties for doing so. And he also signed these things into law. And he said this when he signed some other bill, right? He said, we signed a little law. He says, you heard our monuments. You heard our heroes. You go to jail for 10 years, okay? Everything is stopped. You notice that? It's stopped, okay? No more destroying our stuff. He expressed love for the United States and optimism about the country's future. He says, you know, as this enormous crowd shows, we have truth and justice on our side. We have deep and enduring love for America on our hearts. We love this country. We have overwhelming pride in this great country. We have it deep in our souls. Together, we are determined to defend and preserve our government of the people, by the people, and for the people. He says, our brightest days are before us. Our greatest achievements still await. And both of these, again, these quotes come from his statement there. He said this in the same speech, it sounds like. And don't worry, we'll not take the name off Washington. We will not cancel culture. They want to get rid of Jefferson, but we stopped all of that. The Secret Service now, they say, and the FBI, Your Honor, Judge Chutkin, they estimated that at least 120,000 Americans gathered on the mall for president's speech. They have this here, classified documents reveal the true number, according to Newsweek, estimated it at to be about 120,000. Now, Trump said 250,000. The J6 committee said the crowd at the mall was 53,000, right? So the committee wants it to be like small. So it, it seems like there's a high percentage of insurrectionists in the MAGA community where, you know, it's, it's not, it's, you know, probably, you know, guys like Ray Epps and uh, Christopher Ace buddies, but it is 250,000, you know, maybe a little high, right? Trump likes big numbers. And so they maybe round it up, but they're estimating it about 120,000. Got it. Now they say they gathered in the mall. Government agencies estimated that about 1,200 people, at most 1% of the size of the crowd that was gathered to listen to Trump, actually entered the Capitol, and a smaller percentage than that committed violent acts, footnote 7. Yeah, as few as 1% of the people were fit for the label of insurrectionists, which is also a joke, by the way, okay? And I always want to make this point, because the number is really, really, really small. And I know if you don't have experience with like criminal cases and criminal numbers, it might sound like a lot, 1,200 people, that's a lot of people. It's not a lot of people. Just think about it in context of your local uh, you know, government, right? How many tens of thousands of criminal charges are committed every year in a big city? A lot, right? In Arizona, it's, it's thousands, thousands every year. And in big places like New York, it's tens of thousands a year. So this is just 1,200 people half of whom have taken plea deals already, right? A big portion of those turn themselves in. My point is you could have a Super Bowl weekend in your local area and you'll have 1,200 crimes, in a, 1200 crimes, no problem. Okay, urinating in public, domestic violence goes up, DUIs go up. Think about this holiday weekend coming up, okay? Thanksgiving, look around your cities. There'll be four to 500 DUIs in the bigger cities all, all day, easy, right? Four to 500 DUIs every year in the Phoenix metro area, no problem. And so think about that, right? And a DUI is actually, in my opinion, a lot more complicated than one of these cases. This is just a trespass case. A DUI is blood results and criminal lab testing and retesting and forensics. That's a lot. This is just, so are you there? Yeah. And most of the people even admitted it. So if you can have a state that can prosecute tens of thousands of crimes every year and our, and our U.S. Department of Justice is, is spending three years, essentially, right? We're on year, what is this? Uh, by 2024, we'll be on year three. Of, of investigations here, 1,200 cases, half of which have already pled guilty. Okay, the other half are like made up cases with, you know, the Proud Boys and the, the Oath Keepers, you know, that have a bunch of government witnesses there. So it's a, a very strange number. It's really, really minuscule is my point. Like this, this holiday weekend, uh, over, over the holidays, you'll see easily 1,200 additional surplus of crimes. And the DOJ is stopping everything, right? They've had full committee hearings. They're telling us is the biggest attack on the country since forever. It is like absolutely nothing. And if you just ask yourselves, I know I'm belaboring this point here. Let's say a normal attorney can handle a caseload of 50 felonies at, even, at any given time, right? And just do the math on that. Like just how many attorneys can handle 1,200 cases and 
over three years, right? At any given time with half of them pleading out. It's wild. So it, it's all basically fake as far as I'm concerned. It's just, it's fake numbers. Now there are people, the, the prosecutions are not fake. There are actual people being victimized by this, but they're being made to be a part of this bigger grand scheme. They're not, they're just people who are being uh, abused by our government. So now thus we can easily conclude that over 99% of the attendees at Trump's speech did not engage in the events at the Capitol. Moreover, as the indictment recognizes, a crowd had gathered at the Capitol even before Trump had even finished speaking, further proving he had nothing to do with those events. And so recognizing a large crowd would be attending his speech, President Trump actually sought in advance to have law enforcement fully engaged and to mobilize the National Guard to ensure a safe event. This is a review from the Inspector General. He tried to get things situated. Now, according to General Mark Milley's testimony at the DOD, White Rage Guy, President Trump made a request for the military presence three days before January 6th. This is Mark Milley's testimony. Mark Milley and General Milley, according to this document, says they met with the president at the White House at 530. The primary topic they discussed was unrelated to the scheduled rally, but General Milley told us at the end of the meeting that the president told Mr. Miller there'd be a large number of protesters there on January 6th, a heads up. And Mr. Miller should ensure sufficient National Guard or soldiers would be there to make sure it was safe. General Milley told us that Mr. Miller responded, quote, we've got a plan and we've got it covered. And they arrested Trump anyways for all of that. Okay, and, and Mark Milley, by the way, was one of these uh, whack jobs out there in the media uh, saying that Trump was negligent and having phone calls, you know, and kissy face with Nancy Pelosi in the aftermath, which is in violation of the direct line and chain of command to the commander in chief. Retired U.S. Army with Lieutenant General Keith Kellogg also confirmed General Milley's testimony. Now, according to Kellogg, on January 3rd, three days before, the president asked the Defense Department to deploy the National Guard troops into D.C. For J6 contingencies, President Trump tried to ensure full security, but he was resisted by the mayor and the D D.C. Democrat Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. Other Democrat leaders did the same. Now, despite exhaustive investigation, the FBI found no evidence that President Trump was responsible for the actions at the Capitol. And just the opposite. After seven months of investigation, a report revealed that the FBI has so far found no evidence that Trump or people directly around him were involved in organizing the violence. But tell that to MSNBC. Now, after investigating for more than one year, including by interviewing thousands of individuals and collecting hundreds of thousands of phone calls, text messages, social media postings, and other documents, the FBI still found no evidence connecting Trump to the actions at the Capitol. Despite many breathless stories and conversations and texts and Secret Service meetings blaming Trump for the events of the 6th, there's simply no evidence to be found. Nonetheless, in April 2022, Biden directed his Department of Justice to prosecute his leading opponent for the presidency through a calculated leak to the New York Times by more than a dozen of his aides and allies. They published a story, they said, the attorney general's deliberative approach has come to frustrate Democrat allies of the White House. It's talking about Merrick Garland. Why is he taking so long to prosecute Trump? At times, President Joe Biden himself has been frustrated. As recently as last year, Biden confided to his inner circle that he believed Trump was a threat to democracy and he should be prosecuted. According to two people familiar with the comments, this is the New York Times reporting, Washington Post reporting this saying Biden has said privately he wanted Garland to act less like a ponderous judge and more like a prosecutor who's willing to take decisive action over J6. Now, this article is based on interviews of more than a dozen people, including officials in the Biden administration and people with knowledge of the president's thinking, all of whom asked for anonymity to discuss the private conversations. And so they're going to say, oh, no, no, Joe, no, Joe Biden never directed Merrick to do anything. No, he's just a, a you know, a, a waxing poetic around the White House. Oh, I wish I had a better attorney general. Gosh, I wonder what Merrick's up to. Oh, well, I guess I know something he's not doing. Prosecuting Trump. Oh, Mr. President, that's a zinger. No, of course not. Right. This is the unspoken, unwritten order from the president. And I, I would imagine it's much more spoken right now that they're not going to tell you that they're just going to say, 
Well, he wants him to stop acting like a less like a ponderous judge. The inner circle knows. Half a dozen people know. A dozen people know, not half, a full dozen. They all know it. So within days of President Biden's directive to the DOJ, guess what happened? Those conversations take place and boom, the FBI opens an investigation into the quote electors scheme that ultimately resulted in this indictment just as planned. So they get into some argument now. They say, your honor, it's pretty clear. Any references at the Capitol on January 6th from Jack Smith's indictment are not relevant to any of the charges he's been charged with. They say language in an indictment may be stricken. Take your big red pen out and get rid of it when it's not relevant and when it's prejudicial and inflammatory. They say the indictment here does not charge President Trump with insurrection, of course not, or incitement or any other charge related to any actions at the Capitol on January 6th. The prosecution even admits this. In fact, they also conceded elsewhere that none of the charges against Trump include an element of an incitement offense. They're even acknowledging this. They say none of the offenses charged here, whether it's this one, this one, this one, or this one, has an element, any of the required elements for an incitement offense. Because we're, you know, incitement might go to free speech. And the elements of the charged offenses, defeating a federal government function through deceit, obstruction, through deprivation, they're nowhere, are nowhere to be found in the elements or any other incitement type of an offense. So they say, your honor, look, it's easy. The prosecution has admitted that the incitement allegations that are littered throughout the opposition are not relevant to any of the charges. So they're saying Trump incited, Trump incited, Trump incited. But they say, even in their own filings, that the incitement is not there in their own charges. So nor has the prosecution explained how allegations about the J6 protest are relevant to the elements of the charges that it chose to bring. So there's another explanation for them either. Indeed, they say the J6 cases relied on by the prosecution do not support its contention that actions at the Capitol are relevant and probative of the charge conduct. Several of the cases did not involve any of the charges brought against Trump. And so they, they reference other cases, but they say these things just don't apply. Meanwhile, the prosecution's false assertion that Trump is somehow responsible for the events that day is contradicted by the position taken by the DOJ in countless prosecutions of protesters who were present at the Capitol on January 6th. They say, well, you, you, in the other cases that you're prosecuting these J6ers for, you said that they couldn't blame Trump. They say, for example... Consider this J6er, Dustin Thompson. In its cross-examination of Mr. Thompson, and he testified in his own defense, shout out to Dustin, the government emphasized that Mr. Thompson's actions on January 6th were his own. And they were not caused by anything Trump had to say. Because he says, no, Trump made me do it. And they said, oh, no, you did it, didn't you? Don't blame Trump. Trump's not responsible for this. They say, oh, okay, Mr. Thompson, this is the government. Now, you mentioned that you had before January 6th, you mentioned that you listened to previous rallies of the presidents, right? I have. And after you listened to those other Trump rallies, did you go commit any other crimes? Trying to single this one rally out. Well, I wasn't attending any of those, but no. Okay, so the answer is no. You didn't go commit any other crimes? Correct. And notwithstanding that former President Trump was very passionate during those other speeches, wasn't he? Yeah. And he said a lot of things about elections being stolen in those speeches, didn't he? Yeah. And again, when the president, the former president, referred to the election as stolen during that time in those other rallies, you didn't do anything about it, right? I wasn't asked to. He didn't make any suggestions at that time on what to do about the situation, just that he wasn't going to concede and that he was going to fight about it. Okay, and so you had heard all those things before January 6th, right? Correct. And when you heard it on January 6th, none of it was new, was it? None of what was new? That, the, that he wasn't going to concede. You had already heard that before that day, right? Yes. And you had already heard that the election, you know, that he had said the election was going to be stolen or had been stolen. He says, yeah, this is the last ditch effort. This is the way I looked at it. So the answer is yes, you had heard that before January 6th, right? Yes. And none of that was new to you on the morning of January 6th? No, I was aware of it. 
So the government proceeded to remind the jury, in this case, that President Trump did not cause Mr. Thompson to commit the crimes with which he had been charged. So you see this, this excerpt here is trying to blame this guy, saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, don't blame Trump, okay? You've listened to Trump many times before, right? Many other rallies, you heard it, you didn't do anything. But it was there on January 6th, and that's when you jumped in, and that's when you did something. He says, no, but I was there. And they said, okay, but you were there, but you heard him say things before, like, I'm not going to concede, right? And, and, and so on. And it, they, then in closing, they say, and so President Trump wasn't there standing next to you, was he? And President Trump didn't force you to go to the Capitol, did he? He didn't force you to walk every step of the way to the Capitol building, did he? And no. And President Trump wasn't standing right next to you at the doors to the Capitol building, forcing you to go inside, was he? And you'd agree with me that not once during that hour-long speech did President Trump say it is now legal to steal from the Capitol building, did he? So they say in the government summation at trial, they specifically argued that Trump's conduct leading up to the January 6th was irrelevant. It had nothing to do with this. They said here, it is essentially irrelevant in this case what you think about President Trump's conduct on that day. We don't care. And so moreover, the government also said, President Trump didn't hold his hand as he walked down the Capitol to loot and defile the Senate when he stole those things. And in another example, they took the Oath Keeper trial. Stuart Rhodes, they charged him with seditious conspiracy. Now, according to the indictment returned against Rhodes, they say Rhodes allegedly led this group before, during, and after J6 without any involvement from Trump. Specifically, at Rhodes' detention hearing, the court asked the government. They said, okay, is it the government's contention that had there not been a mob of people at the Capitol that day, say, the Ellipse rally had simply ended, that there hadn't been a mob that marched down to the Capitol, would this group of individuals led by Mr. Rhodes, would they still try to enter the building even without the mob present? Like, we're trying to identify causation. Like, were they going to insurrect regardless, or were they just kind of caught up in the mob? The government says, Your Honor, the evidence is that they talked about the need to go to the Capitol grounds. And they say the defendant also made clear in the same message that President Trump must know that if he fails to act, we will. Okay, if Trump fails to act, we will. He has to understand that we will have no choice. So there is clearly, you know, there were clearly messages that we have directly from the phone evidence that show an intent to be on the Capitol grounds and intent to make those in Congress uncomfortable and an intent to fight to stop them with or without somebody like President Trump calling them into action. They were going to do it anyways. And they say, we think it's critical, Your Honor, that the defendant, this is the government, is not only saying these words at the time, but also saying that these words are not contingent upon anything the president may do. In fact, he's suggesting the president thinks is not going to call the troops like the militia. Militia like the Oath Keepers are similar groups. So in summation, the government reiterated that the events on January 6th, during the trial, they said, happen despite President Trump, not because of him. In their closing arguments, some government prosecutor says, now to be clear, ladies and gentlemen, the government is not alleged here that as early as November, these defendants had their eyes on J6, because how could they? How did they know? But they had hoped that Trump or someone would intercede. But you know, that these things has transpired, the way these things move forward, they knew that they would have to take matters into their own hands. They said Rhodes was clear in these open letters that if Trump didn't do something, they would. But guess what, they say. The government said this in their closing arguments. The president didn't take action. He didn't insurrect. No one did step in to throw out the results of the election and hold a new one. And so Mr. Rhodes and his co-conspirators had to spring into action. But now the prosecution is reversing course. And now they're dishonestly claiming that Trump is responsible, despite not charging him and previously denying his culpability. They say it's entirely specious. So, Your Honor, Judge Chutkin, the prosecution also does not deny or distinguish any of the cases cited by Trump. They cite multiple decisions where the evidence at issue is related to the actual defendant's other actions, not actions by third parties. The only case cited by the government is nonsense. But the prosecution here has cynically made January 6th the heart of the case which is the opposite of the case that they cite. 
Now, finally, the prosecution pretends that relevance has already been recognized. But contrary to the prosecution's claim, our motion to strike is consistent with other filings. It is true, as stated by both the motion to strike and the motion to leave, that the indictment raises certain allegations about J6. And we seek to remove those allegations because they have no authority for the suggestion that Trump is precluded from proceeding in the alternative by trying to collect evidence to defend himself against those unfair allegations. Now, had Trump not proceeded in parallel with those motions, they surely would have waived at least one of his options. And this is why we're left with this motion to strike. They say, Your Honor, the January 6th allegations are not allowed to prove motive or intent. Sometimes you can get in evidence to prove a different thing. And exceptions are motive and intent and others. And uh, as an alternative relevance ground, they say, well, it could show his motive and intent. Now, despite three pages of narrative, in other words, the indictment language could be used to show motive and intent, insurrection, blah, blah, blah. They say this argument is meritless. Despite three pages of narrative, the prosecution only suggests that one of the paragraphs that is subject to our strike does not show motive or intent, but to the contrary, it reflects protected speech by the president and the fact that they try to get this in shows how far afield these claims are from the actual charges in the indictment. Now, finally, as a futile attempt to try to establish relevance, they say it's necessary for context, last ditch little context effort there. Nevertheless, they say, Your Honor, the prosecution did not charge Trump with any crime related to actions at the Capitol, not insurrection, not incitement. The breadth of their indictment stretches far beyond providing context and background. Trump is not charged with triggering events at the Capitol. The prosecution carefully avoided that. Now, despite the lack of evidence, they now are trying to attribute guilt to the president for crimes that it did not charge, and it's doing it based on the actions of others. This effort causes unfair prejudice to Trump. It's not irrelevant. It's not context. They say here, prejudice has now resulted against Trump. Their reliance on these cases is inappropriate. And the voluminous evidence here shows that the jury pool has been already exposed to this indictment. They already think this is an insurrection charge, even though he's not charged with insurrection. This is another reason why this should be struck. And so, Chutkin, this indictment's allegations about the actions at the Capitol on J6 are not relevant. They do not involve Trump. They do not relate to the elements of any charge against Trump. They are inflammatory. They're prejudicial. Their purpose is only to attack Trump's character with false allegations that will require a mini trial for those and the collateral and are collateral to the charges the prosecution actually filed. So Trump respectfully requests you grant the motion to strike and delete that from the indictment signed by Trump lawyers, John Loro, Todd Blanche on behalf of Trump. Now, there was another filing as well. We'll take a quick look at here. This is Trump's filing asking for a stay pending a decision at the higher level court of appeals. They submitted this as well. Trump's defense says, Your Honor, this is President Trump's reply in support of our motion to stay the entire case. Pause it. Pending resolution of our other motion to dismiss based on presidential immunity. They say... All right, check in. Police officers, correction officers, federal agents, executive officials, prosecutors, federal prosecutors, state judges, federal judges, members of Congress, all of these officials routinely obtain stays of discovery and other pretrial proceedings when they assert official immunity. Pending fe fi final resolution of the asserted claims of those immunity. Now, the prosecution here, through Jack Smith, contends that President Trump should be the only official in America who is not entitled to the same considerations. Now, that position is meritless. The court should reject Jack Smith's arguments and stay all proceedings until there's a final resolution of Trump's claims of presidential immunity. Saying Jack Smith concedes that the court should decide President Trump's claim of immunity ahead of other motions. In fact, they do not even dispute that the claims of immunity are subject to interlocutory appeal, meaning they are appealing it now. And they say here, as an assertion of immunity, however, this simple assertion 
protects Trump not just against going to trial, but against all the burdens of litigation. They say for this here, for the same reason, denial of a claim of presidential immunity. As explained in the first line of Trump's motion, the Supreme Court has repeatedly stressed the importance of resolving this quickly because denial is immediately appealable collateral order. You can immediately appeal it. Now, as noted, Jack Smith is not even disputing these things, but the prosecution ignores the reasons for these doctrines. Now, even though such reasons are stated just as clearly in SCOTUS opinions, SCOTUS emphasizes that immunity decisions should be decided as early as possible and are subject to interlocutory review appeal precisely because immunity provides immunity from suit, including all attendant burdens of litigations, not just immunity from trial or judgment. Meaning, look, what good is immunity if it's only the trial, but everything else you're having to suffer through? Immunity doctrines, therefore, ensure that officials are protected from the expenses of litigation, the diversion of official energy, pressing public issues, the deterrence of citizens from running from public office. This is a SCOTUS case from 1982. Saying that the consequences prevented by official immunity include both the risks of trial and pretrial discovery matters. And so Jack Smith also concedes the latter point but disregards the reason for the doctrine. The prosecution through Jack Smith envisions that this case should proceed with the discovery and all pretrial proceedings up until the morning of trial. Then when it's time, Chuck can can say, up immunity. And only be stayed the morning of trial if there has been no final determination of Trump's immunity by then. Now the Supreme Court cases explicitly reject that view. Official immunity means the officer asserting the immunity should not be subject to either the costs of trial or to the burdens of broad reaching discovery. That's why it's called immunity. In fact, the sole case that the government cites for this view contradicts the very point that they're trying to make. They say, in the case they cited, they say that immunity is designed to protect individuals from the burdens of litigations as well as the possibility of litigation. Now here, the burdens of litigation are huge. They're particularly acute, which Jack Smith conveniently ignores and it's rushed to judgment. This case involves 13 million pages of unclassified discovery. And my friends, trial is in March. Just do the math on that. Here, which we don't do here, discovery and hundreds of potential witnesses are also involved. That's pages, not to mention hours of surveillance footage. Okay, it is literally going to be impossible for Trump's team to review it all. It's impossible. It is also subject, if they put it all online, maybe we could all attend to it, but they're not going to do that. It is also subject to pretrial hurdles that can be caused by SEPA. So the cost, labor, the time of preparing this case for trial, especially with the highly compressed seven month time frame adopted by this court, are staggering. It's like insane. It's like, a lawyer cannot do a good job. You know, you see in the movies where they just like throw the guy in the lion's den. They like throw a lawyer at him. They're like, uh, well, how do you plead? Uh, no, you're not guilty. You're on. And they like execute him anyways. Right. It's like a token case. It's called a show trial. It's exactly what's happening in America. No way you can get through all of this in seven months. Now, the Supreme Court instructs that Trump should not have to shoulder these burdens of litigation unless we've decided that he's not immune. And so the prosecution's argument to the contrary is totally meritless. So they say, Your Honor, in an apparent effort to prejudice the jury pool, the government recites inflammatory rhetoric. They make personal attacks on Trump. They attack his defense counsel, but they cite almost no case law. The few additional arguments that the government does make are unpersuasive. First, they repeatedly accuse Trump of trying to disrupt and delay the proceedings by seeking a stay. Totally baseless. You're not trying to disrupt or uh, delay. Stop using that conjugated language, that emotive language. This charge is baseless. Trump is plainly entitled to a stay of proceedings pending a final determination of his immunity. He's entitled for, for this. He's not disrupting anything. It's part of due process. To assert Trump's clearly establishment entitled as a disruption or a delay, it constitutes a taking 
does not constitute meritorious litigation. They also falsely contend that Trump attempted to unreasonably delay the proceedings by filing his motion to dismiss. How dare he? But they neglect to mention that Trump's exhaustively researched 45-page motion, while they did it all, while they're also seeking to review 13 million pages of discovery, thousands of hours of video and audio, responding to unreasonable demands for an immediate trial, dissecting which exculpatory information may have been illegally deleted and destroyed by the House of Representatives, investigating J6, dealing with efforts to wrongfully gag the leading candidate for president, addressing politically motivated efforts by the prosecution to interfere in an election, preparing extensive pretrial motions on various other issues on extremely compressed timeframes, and defending multiply also other politically driven cases, including one brought by the same prosecutors involved in this case. We're busy. The suggestion that President Trump was somehow dilatory in filing his immunity motion early, well ahead of the deadline, reflects the desperation of the Biden administration's efforts in this political prosecution against their leading political opponent, President Trump. Now, finally, Chutkin, Though the issue is not presented in this motion, the court pr prosecution contends that Trump's claim of double jeopardy is plainly frivolous and the court should deem it so in writing. Now, presumably, they would personally attack Justice Alito for taking the very same position that Trump advances. Alito said this, the plain implication of the impeachment judgment clause is that criminal prosecution, like removal from the presidency and disqualification, is a consequence that can only come after the Senate's judgment and not prior to the Senate trial. In other words, as the Constitution explains, you got to be in, impeached and then convicted, and then you can be indicted. In any event, Trump's defense says, the prosecution does not contend that President Trump's assertion of presidential immunity, the asserted basis for a stay motion, is frivolous, nor could it. Therefore, a motion for a stay should be granted. Signed here by John Loro, Todd Blanche from Donald Trump's defense and another very good motion. Now, of course, both of these motions are going to be denied by Judge Chutkin because she is not going to allow any delay in this case because she's got her marching orders. This case is taking place in March before the primaries and it is not going to move unless a higher court orders her to move it. No argument is going to be persuasive, in my opinion. Now, if the Court of Appeals comes out or there's some like mandatory reason for her to move it, she'll move it. But she's going to do everything she can to avoid it because she wants this trial to happen. I think that Fannie has a very weak case. I'll be curious if that case happens before the election at all. And then the Florida case is looking like that's going to get bumped as well. So all their eggs are in this basket. They are going to keep this case anchored in hard, She's going to deny the inflammatory language motion because she's, you know, thinks it's all relative and relevant. And so we'll follow this when her orders drop. We're going to have other replies from Trump later in November for his other motions to dismiss. So be sure you're joining us as we cover them. Thank you for subscribing to our channel wherever you're watching it. Thank you for sharing this content with a friend or family member so they can see really what's going on, right? A lot of these are Trump's defenses that we're just not hearing about in other parts of the media. And so thanks for inviting them over here so we can go through it together and we'll look forward to seeing you on the next one. Now, let's turn our attention over to Georgia and see what's happening over here because we've also got big fannies making some big moves here. And this one involves Harrison Floyd, who we've talked about here previously. And so we're gonna get back into him you may remember him from prior streams here together, but let's get right to it. Fannie Willis in Georgia is now moving to revoke this guy's bond. He's co of course has been charged in the Rico case prosecuted by Fannie Willis. Donald Trump is another co-defendant, but Harrison Floyd has already been serving jail. He's already been in jail and now Fannie wants to send him back. And so we're going to go through this Motion to revoke Harrison Floyd's bond, which is something that Fannie just submitted. And it comes after Harrison Floyd was posting some stuff on X. He was saying that Fannie has a pretty bad case and some of the witnesses in the case are not so hot. And she says, uh-oh, those posts amount to witness tampering. And so here's what the motion looks like. 
out of Fulton County. It is state of Georgia versus Donald Trump and many other people. But this specifically is about this guy, Stephen Harrison William Prescott Floyd. There's the name. So many co-defendants here, I couldn't even find them. And so you can see this is Fannie's motion to revoke the bond concerning Harrison Floyd. And here's what Fannie says. She's very upset. Let's put him back in jail. Now, he was already in jail the first time because of a bond problem, right? He was there showing up and didn't have an attorney, and the judge held him in bond until he posted bond, and now he's out. So now she says it's time for him to go back. It says here, Fannie requests that the court enter an order revoking the bond that was already previously granted to Harrison Floyd, saying here that the Fulton County Grand Jury charged him with crimes, and on August 29th, four days, five days after he surrendered, so he went and surrendered August 24th, and then was released from custody August 29th, the court entered a consent bond order, and they set bail, and he said that he has to do certain things. As terms of his release, they said he shall perform no act to intimidate any person known to him or to be a co-defendant or a witness in this case, saying he shall not communicate in any way, either directly or indirectly, with the facts of the case, and not communicate any way, directly or indirectly, with any person known to him to be a witness in this case, except through counsel. Okay, so these are the release conditions that the judge imposed when they released him from custody. Now, since his release from custody, they say the defendant has engaged in numerous intentional and flagrant violations of release, saying that since November 1st, the defendant has publicly tweeted, and they're called X's now, Fanny, get it right, from the X account, it's called X, hello, at HW underscore Floyd, which I'm following, you might want to follow as well, in an effort to intimidate co-defendants and witnesses to communicate directly and indirectly with co-defendants and witnesses and to otherwise obstruct the administration of justice. Well, she does definitely does not want him, you know, talking about this. So the defendant's Twitter account has 25,000 followers who can view his public tweets. And I have done that myself. Now, on November 1st, the defendant tweeted the following to a witness. Brad Raffensperger also sent this one to Gabriel Sterling and tagged their Twitter accounts. He's actually tagging them, which constitutes an act to intimidate known witnesses and direct communication with known witnesses about the facts of the case in violation of conditions of release. Let's see what he's tagging him to do. And here's what he says. Uh, David Goldiner posted this on X. Says, hey, responding to H.W. Floyd. Says, get some decent legal advice before you end up spending 20 years in prison for someone who could care less about you. And he said, passing this along to the Secretary of State and to Gabriel Sterling, says, should they be more concerned about interfering in elections, perjury before Congress, lying to DA Fannie Willis, or all of the above? Right, so he's actually talking kind of about the case and maybe them as a witness. Now, on November 6, they say he participated in a video recorded and widely disseminated interview on a conservative daily podcast. During the interview, the defendant discussed the facts of the case, and he communicated indirectly to co-defendant and witness Jenna Ellis, okay, so he discussed her guilty plea, saying that in violation of his release conditions, saying that the defendant stated the following, said President Trump was underserved by people like her, Jenna, people who would go into the Oval Office and tell him one thing, and then behind his back, they would do another. Now, I'm not a lawyer, he says. I'm not a Harvard JD, but guess who is? Jenna Ellis, right? She literally, if she truly believed everything that she was saying, she could have defended her own self. She didn't need a quarter million dollars of people's hard-earned money to be raised offline, you know? And it doesn't take a quarter million dollars to accept a plea deal either or to deny one, okay? So she just, she just showed us who she really is. Hmm. Interesting take there, Harrison. Now, he continues. Now, in addition, and Fanny just definitely does not want that to, to go out there, of course. Now, in addition to participating in any of the above reference interviews on November 6th, the defendant also tweeted the following link to the interview to amplify its viewership. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you, set, you definitely don't want to go watch this, do you? This might be something interesting to watch after this show's over, but I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Harrison Floyd says, thanks for having me on. And here, 
what happened here? Real Joel Altman had a conversation about David Clements. Okay, looks like 3,000 views. It probably could be more than that now that Fannie wants to ban it. I mean, if you ban these things, you know, people want to know more about it is all. So on November 7th, the defendant also tweeted the following to a witness called Brad Raffensperger, who's still the Secretary of State over there, okay? Like, he still is in government. Can you not talk to him? And Gabriel Sterling, and he tagged their Twitter accounts, which they say constituted an act to intimidate known witnesses and direct communication with known witnesses about the facts of the case. And so Fannie says that Harrison needs to go to jail. Go to jail for posting about the case. Now, on November 7th, the defendant tweeted to the following witnesses, Brad Raffensperger, Gabriel Sterling, and he tagged their Twitter accounts. Again, witness intimidation. Brooklyn Flowers says to Floyd, says, you're broke and going to waste money and putting forth, or maybe he's talking uh, to Raffensperger. Oh no, he's talking to, he's talking to Floyd. This guy says, as, as if those five days you spent in jail wasn't enough. We're going to lock you up. Can't wait to lock you up in Georgia. They're getting into it. You're going to jail, buddy. My partisan prosecutor is going after you. Harrison said, black American Dems want the black Trump guy to tell on racist white Republicans, but only if it's President Trump, LOL. Look, the truth is the Georgia Secretary of State and Gabriel Sterling are the pieces of poop emoji that you should be mad at. Make elections fair again. Thumbs up. It's not a bad point there, Harrison. Here's another one. On November 8th, the defendant tweeted to the witness Brad Raffensperger and he tagged his Twitter account, which is an act of witness intimidation. Anthony Scott, who is this, says senior VP of customer operations of election systems and software, the company responsible for PA votes flipping, says it was human error that someone from our team, quote, programmed the election. Harrison Floyd reposted that, said it's over. Georgia Secretary of State Raffensperger needs to call his lawyer. He's about to go through some things, exclamation point, hashtag fraud, hashtag cheating, hashtag election interference. Harrison continues, on November 13th, he also tweeted the following to co-defendant and witness Jenna Ellis and to Dan Scavino, who has not been charged with anything, and tagged their Twitter accounts, which constituted an act to intimidate a known co-defendant and a witness and direct communication. So Midas Touch, which is a major lit account, during, it says during her proffer session before Georgia prosecutors, Jenna Ellis said a statement said the boss is not going to leave during a drunk White House Christmas party that nobody cares about. And Trump did leave, so it's like totally irrelevant. What are you talking about? He's not going to leave? He did leave. What? Okay, they like packed up. It was like a whole thing. So they left. So Harrison responded to Jenna. He says, wow, Jenna, you're a whole mess, girl. So you didn't stop at stealing people's hard-earned money for your defense? You're also lying on Dan Scavino? This is probably the one that did it probably the one that did it. I guess they don't teach ethics at Harvard Law anymore. Hashtag give back the money. <laughs> I told you he's a good follow, man. HW underscore Floyd. So, you know, you're, you're also lying on Dan Scavino, uh, of course, which, you know, we, didn't, we haven't heard from Dan Scavino, but it sounds like even if it, he said something like that, like they left. And we were talking about this on our locals after party yesterday. Maybe... It was, he's just saying, we're not going to leave the party because the artichoke dip is out of this world, man. It's crazy. Have you had it? Uh, get, go get some. Trust me. No, I know you don't like it. Just go try some. It's not, no, it doesn't taste like it. Just go try it. You know, we are just going to stay in power. He's like, I'm not leaving this party, man. I got endless artichoke dip. So on November 17th, he then, Harrison, he also tweeted the following about co-defendants and witnesses Jenna Ellis and Sidney Powell which constituted an act to intimidate witnesses. He posted this from ABC News. They were sharing Sidney Powell's tweet. This guy, Harrison, who's under indictment by Fannie, says there is literally nothing here but calling, name calling, and speculation, right? Nothing here. These are the ones that did it, right? He was, he was going off and they didn't care all that much until he starts posting about these. He's right. He's dead right. We were watching these. We're like, there's nothing. This is it. This is the big reveal. Like all of these proffers were supposed to be the end of Trump. They got smoke and plea deals because they were going to get him on the back end. And this is it. 
Even Harrison Floyd, he's been charged with a crime. He's like, there's nothing here. Leaking Jenna Ellis and Sidney Powell the proffer is nothing more than an attempt at tainting the jury pool. Fulton County is corrupt. When is GA leadership going to step up? Well, no, they're not going to. It turns out the defense leaked it, but there's nothing else in there, it sounds like, right? And I think the, the, the defense wanted to set the record straight. They're making these plea deals and proffers like there's something there. There's nothing there. The defense is like, look. It, it, it ain't there, right? Fanny ain't got nothing. So they say here, Harrison keeps Xing, says the defendant Xed, come on, Fanny, the following about Ruby Freeman, which is also an, a witness act, uh, a witness who's now intimidated. Harrison Floyd posted this. And I'm not real familiar with this story, but Fanny put it in her motion. Here's what she says. She says, Harrison posted this. If we are sharing and leaking videos today, like I said from the start, Ruby Freeman was terrified and wouldn't talk to anyone white. That's weird. Why? Because racism and political terrorism in Georgia is still very real. This is a cover-up, and Fulton County is corrupt. And so he shared this video. It's probably still up on his X account. You can go watch it over there when you go and subscribe. Now, approximately one hour later, they say that Harrison posted a comment that stated, so this begs the question, if Ruby Freeman didn't trust white people to help her, what did she say to the black people that offered to help her? I'll wait for you to get your popcorn. This constituted an act to known to intimidate a witness. Now here's another one. They say on November 14th, he also tweeted the following, saying yesterday, the Fulton County DA's office leaked proffer videos, and now they're trying to blame my team in order to get a protective order. Now, this is partially true, right? They did try to blame his team and they played it hard. Now, Harrison at the time did not know that it came from another defense attorney, right? So he was presuming that they did it, which was a pretty good presumption at the time. Now we were all kind of caught off guard by the defense leaking it, but I get it, I get it, because there was nothing there. And the, only, the only blind spot that we had was, was there anything else there? Like there was nothing in the videos we saw, but we, you know, the full proffer is much longer than that. So we just saw, you know, uh, two and a half minutes total between the two videos. So we didn't know if it was gonna be like a bigger leak, you know, does Fanny have more stuff coming or what? But no. Probably not. That's why the defense leaked it. There's nothing else there, literally, that, that Fanny's case is crap. So they say, look for Fanny. If I, he says, look, Fanny, if I was going to leak something, it wouldn't be Sidney Powell or Jenna Ellis. It would be this. And this is a clip that he posted on his ex account saying, I do want an attorney from Ruby Freeman. I wonder why that might be. I, wonder, I don't know why she might want an attorney, you know, curious. She's just an election poll worker, right? So they say here on November 14th, they also saw Harrison Floyd tweet about this. He said, or I would share that the officers who overheard the whole conversation thought there was a cover-up. And he says, I would tweet this one. I would just share that the officers who overheard the whole thing, saying that the other officer says she didn't feel comfortable talking to somebody, right? And you can go listen to the whole thing right on his ex account, all 57 seconds about it. Oh, very curious. I, I wonder what she was going to say or what, what, what this cover-up was about. Who were they? What were they doing? I don't know. Harrison Floyd's certainly talking about it. You know who doesn't want him to talk about it? Oh, yeah, Fanny. <laughs> so here, uh, we're going to look at another post from Harrison that Fanny does definitely not want us to read. But it says here, the defendant tweeted the following about Ruby Freeman. Says, so... And again, this is not, uh, I think, witness intimidation at all. I mean, I think uh, what he's doing is, is articulate. Now, now, it's in violation, I think, probably of his release conditions. But as a, uh, as a con, as you know, a new crime or something like that, maybe they'll charge him with a new crime. We'll see. So Harrison, for she could. We'll, we'll see. So if there is no protective order, here's the 911 call that shows. And you know, now that I'm thinking about that. Now that I'm thinking about that, that might be the strongest charge that she has in this entire case is like a new charge for something like that. Like wait, wait to hit him on a, wait, wait to hit him again on a process crime. Maybe that's where she's going. We'll see. So no threats were made, he says. So if there if there is no protective order, here's the 911 call, which is part of the public record. He says no threats were made. Ruby Freeman wanted them to come back 
and to tell her what we could do for her. Ruby set up the meeting at the police station, not me. I did nothing wrong. So he's just pro proclaiming his innocence here. He's explaining himself in the court of public opinion, in the court where many Americans are observing this case. And Fanny wants it protected under protective orders. She wants him now arrested for violating the terms of his release conditions. She wants Fanny and Sydney not saying anything about any of this stuff because they're basically, you know, gagged now from talking about the case. And he is basically doing the same thing Trump's doing, right? He's defending himself in the court of public opinion, just like Donald Trump is doing. This is a political prosecution against Donald Trump, who happens to be the leading political candidate. But this guy was highly involved in working on behalf of Trump. And he's also a victim of the umbrella of criminal prosecution. So now he's exercising his free speech to talk about these other people. And now they're trying to essentially throw him back in jail. Now he is not the president, right? So this is going to go a little bit differently for him. But he's trying to make his case in the court of public opinion while they're trying to railroad him elsewhere. And maybe they'll charge him with another crime now that I'm thinking about it. But they say on November 4th, the defendant tweeted the following about Freeman. Why would my team leak Jenna Ellis and proffer videos when there's better stuff? Here, Fanny, how about this? For instance, we could leave this one. We could leak this, that Ruby Freeman's job was the reconciliation of ballots. She wasn't even supposed to be on a scanner. Now, I think this stuff is more, you know, more safe because he's just talking about the case. He's not actually like tagging Ruby Freeman on those. But the other things where he's tagging people, that's the thing that gives me a little bit of concern on that. Like he's actually tagging people, like it's actually direct communication. But here on Ruby's, right, he's not actually tagging her. And he's not tagging Jenna and Sydney. And here, Dan Scavino has not been charged. Jenna has taken a plea deal. So it's like a direct communication. Georgia Secretary of State, you know, that one's a little bit hairy right there. So we'll see. Now, I, uh, look, by the way, I'm all in favor of free speech. I'm not trying to go that direction here. I'm just saying, what is Fanny going to be doing? What is she go? Where is this? What's the next step here? She's going to say he violated his release conditions and is probably gathering evidence to charge him with theoretically another crime. And since the rest of her cases here, including Harrison's, are so dang weak, she's offering everybody diversion deals. That might actually be a safer case for her, honestly. Now, the defendant on November 14th did it again. Says here, DA Fanny Willis doesn't want you to know the following. And this guy's just on a tear. Court of Public Opinion defending himself says federal agents knew and approved the meeting. No threats were mentioned. Ruby Freeman was provided options for help at her discretion. Hashtag Fulton County, hashtag fraud, hashtag Georgia, all the documents all the videos on his X account. And you can also see the frequency is picking up. Okay, November 14th, November 14th, and so on. So she's trying to shut him up. He's just been going off. Now, I did not set up the meeting at the police station, says Harrison Floyd. Ruby Freeman asked the officers to arrange and facilitate the meeting. We did nothing wrong. He's defending himself in the court of public opinion since they're trying to gag everybody else elsewhere. He shares his photo on his X account. It's actually a full minute video that you can follow him and watch at HW underscore Floyd on the X account. And he's got this photograph of a dog and an officer and other things taking place. He posted this, 812. Does this sound like Ruby Freeman is being pressured? Listen to it. Why would DA Fanny Willis try to hide this from the public? Good question, Harrison. Very good question. Yeah, I think it's important to talk about these things. Now he says, uh, this is what Fanny says. Now as detailed, witness Ruby Freeman has been a frequent target of his intimidating communications and count 31, he's charged with influencing witnesses in violation, which involves Ruby Freeman herself. And because of his intimidating communications, Ruby Freeman has been the subject of renewed threats and violence from third parties, right? We're gonna we'll see what she does here. Now as set forth, since his release from custody, Defendant has engaged in a pattern of intimidation known towards co-defendants and witnesses. This is the same type of garbage language we hear from Trump. Sounds like Molly from the Jack Smith's office or Jay Bratt. Communications about the facts to this case to known co-defendants and witnesses and the obstruction of the administration of justice in violation of this order. It says here, 
Harrison's actions demonstrate that he poses a significant threat of intimidating witnesses and otherwise obstructing justice, making him ineligible for bond, meaning he's got to go back into jail. Okay, no fines like Angeron gave to Trump or anything. Jail. Accordingly, the state requests that the, or the court enter in an order revoking the bond that was previously granted to Harrison Floyd. Can't X from jail. Sign here personally by Fannie Willis. Look at that one. Fannie got off her fanny and signed that one. And that's a curious thing. So here's what they want. Here's the consent order. They say he was already on a $100,000 bond. He posted 10 of that. And here's what they, this, they signed this one back in August, right? And here's the release conditions. Shall not communicate in any way, directly or indirectly, about the facts of the case. But I would, so let's just say, like it doesn't say he can't use social media. No act to intimidate any person known to him to be a co-defendant or witness. It's very broad, okay? So like, there's a lot to interpret here. And so we'll see what the judge does about it. Now, the judge has scheduled a hearing on this and ordered him to be there, has ordered Harrison Floyd to actually physically be there, which is always a nerve wracking experience when your client is potentially going back into custody. So we'll see what that looks like. Now that hearing, I believe is scheduled for next week so that Harrison Floyd has time to get there, but it will be an in-person order uh, hearing. And then we'll see what the judge does with that order. We'll see if they throw him back in custody or not, or the judge issues a warning or gives him a little talking to or what, or maybe nothing. We'll see. But this is also what the judge has issued on the protective order. So we had a debate about the leaky footage. Leaky Fanny and her leaky office has a leaky footage problem. And according to them, they said that we don't want the defense attorneys to continue to post this stuff all over the interweb so we can, they can, everybody can see what a garbage, terrible case we have. And so they've decided that they want a protective order. Now, yesterday, we heard that a defense attorney had already leaked these, this footage. You know, has already been... Uh, reviewed it and said, there's nothing here and everybody should know it because the media was telling us that these were huge victories for Rico and Fannie and they're not, they were terrible. So here we see that the state uh, requested an order. A lot of people on the defense agreed with the order. The media detests the order and, and some criminal defendants did too because they want all of it to be public. But here's what the judge says. On September 27th, the state requested entry of a protective order. Then we got notice that they began negotiating about a joint protective order. One week later, Schaefer filed a second notice, said we're at a, a protective order impasse, and the court never got a proposal. When the court inquired about a protective order, they said, said that we're not yet ready for a ruling. Now, right, so the government kind of blamed the judge for not issuing a protective order at the outset. And the judge is backhanding them right now and saying, hold on a minute. Don't tell me that I didn't get an order even though you asked for one. I inquired about the matter in open court and the state and council indicated they're not ready for a ruling. Now you filed an emergency motion and the defense responded. So we conducted a remote hearing that we listened to previously on this channel. The full video should be out. And several people did not appear, but everyone did. Now, intervening counsel. So he says, what happened? Uh, these people consented to the entry of the order. Defendants Clark, Harrison Floyd, and Hampton, they opposed any order with various levels of strenuousness. Some did not appear, and intervening counsel for the media also voiced his objection. Now, having considered the dueling proposed orders, the law, the court finds the entry of a protective order concerning pretrial discovery is necessary ah! and justified by this case. They say in Georgia law, if there could be some harm, an order is appropriate. Thus, setting aside whether there is a substantial threat he says, I've got some other concerns. He says, discovery is designed to avoid unnecessary surprise and a party may attempt to delay and do things with disclosure. 
and we're going to have battles over whether there should be releases. Now, he says, borrowing from well-litigated principles at a higher level court, the court also notes that this does not offend the First Amendment. So it helps with the facilitation of the trial and the process. It's not a mandatory thing that everybody has unfettered access to it. And it also doesn't offend the First Amendment, which is what I was really looking for. It says, in addition, here, the proposed protective order exempts information gained from other sources and is more narrowly tailored than a blanket umbrella order that covers all discovery. So he feels safe under the law that he can do it. The likelihood of harm in this case is severe as extensive media coverage guarantees broad dissemination of any disclosed discovery materials. And finally, the order is not indefinite and will expire. So with these in mind, we are entering the attached protective order proposed by Schaefer. Now, you know, I think it's interesting because I would like to see those proffers. Now, I actually agree with him. Like if we saw those proffers and more of that, I think it would make Fanny's job harder to secure these plea deals. Or I'm sorry, she would have less, she would have more pressure to not secure the plea deals. Fanny has cover right now because nobody knows what she's doing. If we all know what she's doing and the left starts seeing that these cases are weak as heck and they're not going to result in any actual convictions and including Trump, they're going to start demanding some more pressure from her. She's, a, she's like making these go away by just giving them diversion deals. So here is the order. It says the protective order does not apply to information or records that are publicly available. The purposes, sensitive materials shall mean anything that the state and their discovery produces to the defense in good faith. The state shall review its obligations. Anything that's sensitive shall be designated sensitive. If you think it, it is designated sensitive and it should not be, you've got 14 days to challenge that. And it applies to everybody in your offices. You can modify this protective order and so on. So, all right, it, it, I think it's basically limiting most most of the disclosure, anything that's deemed sensitive. So we're not going to, we're not going to see more plea proffers, unfortunately, is what I'm guessing. So the defense attorneys are not going to release it. Fanny's not going to release it. And it just, you know, figures. Now we'll see if anybody appeals it or not, or whether they just live with it. I tend to think that they will. So we'll see what happens at the bond hearing, whether Judge McAfee puts Harrison Floyd back into custody or just gives him a little bit of a warning. I think it's probably going to be the latter, but we'll see. We'll be covering it, my friends. This case, the RICO case, all the other Trump trials. Be sure you are subscribed. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for checking out robertgovea.com where you can access these PDF files, access the mind map, sign up for our newsletter so you get the show segments delivered to your inbox so you never miss a thing. We'll be looking forward to seeing you right back here on the next one. All right. And my friends, so we'll see what happens with Harrison. And then lastly, let's jump over to the Angeron gag order. Oh, gosh. We've got this story coming up with Judge Angeron. Judge Angeron's gag order has now been stayed by an appeals court in the state of New York. This comes after Tishy Letish James has been prosecuting Trump for weeks now, and the judge doesn't want Trump's defense attorneys talking about his law clerk called Allison Greenfield, a.k.a. GF, Greenfield, short GF, the judge's GF, has been very, very close to the judge, right? This is her laptop right here, sitting next to him on the bench, handing him little love notes. Nobody really knows what was going on because the judge gagged everybody, said, you can't talk about it. Said, don't you dare talk about my love notes with my GF. And now Trump and his people have appealed it and they've won a temporary interim stay of that gag order. And Trump has responded to this ever so subtly. And I'll share with you what that is. But this is what Frank Runyon, who was there, said happened. And it was kind of a surprising little detour of a day because we weren't really expecting much here today. This is what Frank said. Now he reports over from Law 360 and he said, no, Trump filed an emergency suit suing Justice Angeron. Okay, it's an application, it's a challenge, it's a suit with an appellate court seeking to overturn Judge Angeron's gag order. Now I'm waiting to get the full filings here because all this stuff is super fresh, but the Supreme Court's gag order, they say, 
entered during the non-jury trial and the underlying proceeding, they say, is unconstitutional. And the sanctions violate the law. Here's an excerpt from Trump's filing. It says, Judge Angeron may not, by judicial decree, transmogrify the court's summary contempt power into an unfettered license to inflict punishments, public punishments, on a defendant for the defendant's out-of-court statements made for the benefit of the fourth estate, which I think transmogrify is a Calvin and Hobbes hearkening. So, nor does the court's summary contempt power authorize the Supreme Court and its staff to actively and independently investigate and prosecute violations of a gag order, saying Judge Engeron's enforcement of a gag order has violated multiple sections of judiciary law, casts serious doubt on his ability to function as an impartial finder of fact in a bench trial. His extraordinary expansion of that order both limits and chills advocacy on petitioner's behalf and precludes Trump's lawyers on pain of contempt for making a record of misconduct and bias in the courtroom. And so that's going to be a great filing that we'll go through in full detail But when we get it. But the current response on this is several of the press, like a, a select few of the press, learned about this. Like Trump filed it. They issued a, you know, uh, immediate oral arguments. And so they jumped over to what he says are the gilded appellate courthouses in Uptown right now. They just ran over there. We've been led to a small conference room with red carpets, oversized portraits of former judges, and the judge walks in like, oh man, what the heck's going on here? And guess what? He says, this is not going well for the attorney general. Justice Friedman is highly skeptical of Judge Angeron's gag orders. Obviously, they're insane. And breaking, Associate Justice David Friedman temporarily lifted the Justice Angeron's gag orders on Donald Trump and his attorneys in the civil fraud case. Here was the initial order saying, considering the constitutional and statutory rights at issue, an interim stay is granted. Signed 11-27-23, expedited. Signed by the judge and the court clerk. Says, Angeron and the attorney general's briefs are due by November 22nd. So Angeron has to file a response as to why he thinks this is appropriate. Tishy has to file a response. And then Trump issues a reply by November 27th. Then the entire panel is going to decide on this case. And that is going to be good. Real good. So make sure you're subscribed because we'll be covering all of that. Now, a little bit more on the meat, meat on the bones here from the AP article that posts the following. They were also there, it sounds like, in the court. They say a gag order that barred Trump from commenting about court personnel was lifted temporarily. The gag order was suspended, and this comes after Angeron had already issued two gag orders, sanctioned violations against Trump, totaling $15,000. There was an emergency hearing on Thursday. Friedman questioned Angeron's authority to police Trump's speech. Oh, how can you control that? Like his frequent gripes about the case in social media and other comments to TV cameras and in the courthouse hallway. He said, you know, it's true. The judges can issue gag orders. They're mostly used in criminal cases where there's a fear that comments about the case could influence the jury. But this is a civil trial and there is no jury. Trump's lawyer, Christopher Keese, was there. Now, he said after Friedman ruled, he said the appellate judge made the right decision, allowing Trump to take full advantage of his First Amendment rights to talk about bias in his own trial. What he's seeing and what, what he's witnessing at his own trial. He's seeing it. And frankly, everyone needs to see it. Alina Abba indicated she had no plans to advise the former president to stay quiet. I don't see a reason for restrictions because Ms. James is continuing to dis disparage my client, says Ms. Abba. Both sides need to be able to speak. She's posting X account posts all the time. So why can't he? Now, Trump hasn't threatened the clerk's safety, she said. She suggested that the Greenfield GF was bringing scrutiny upon herself by being visible in court, by using social media, by donating thousands of dollars to Democrats. Friedman's ruling also applies to Trump's lawyers as well. And so they've repeatedly says that, that Greenfield has been playing, doing some very strange stuff with the judge. Angeron said, no, she's my law clerk. I can do whatever I want with her and she's very beautiful. And the constitution they say is now protecting Trump. 
And I totally agree. He should be free to speak about this. And it sounds like the Court of Appeals currently agrees. Now, this is the order that came out from the judge. And you can see here's some more. This got filed. It looks like a dated summary statement on application. So this is, looks like the cover sheet. The application, they say, is for an interim stay of enforcement of two unconstitutional gag orders and imposition of sanctions there under pending a full panel determination petition brought in the nature of a mandamus and prohibition. Okay, so that's the type of action they brought. If applying for a stay, why are the reasons? And it's so funny, right? Lawyers, like we fill out forms all day. It's like just forms. So here, Supreme Court gag order entered during a non-jury trial and the underlying proceeding are unconstitutional and sanctions imposed violate the judiciary law and rules of this court. They say, has any undertaking been posted? They say no. They say, if yes, state the amount. Has this application been made for relief? No. Any prior? No. Adversary Tishy been advised of this? Yes. Who's the attorneys? Christopher Keese, Clifford Robert, and Alina Abba. Who's the opposition? The attorney general, Faherty, Eric Daniel, and Judge Angeron is there, along with Lisa Evans. And he says, okay. They fill out the form. He hears oral arguments. He just closes it out right there. Considering the constitutional and statutory rights at issue, an interim stay is granted. Boom. Signed off by the judge. Obviously, the right decision. What we're witnessing there in Angeron's courtroom is lunacy, and we've been watching it ever since. Now, Trump made a slight nod to this. All right. He posted this as soon as the order dropped. He said this, just a simple little reach truth, just a little, oh, oh, that's good to know. That's very good to know. He didn't say anything, but he did post. He says, yeah, oh, a New York judge lifts the gag order. Well, that's pretty fun. That's pretty fun. And so we'll see if Trump says anything else before that was something that was lifted. He posted this this morning. He said, why doesn't the implosion of the AG of the New York State star witness end this witch hunt? He admitted on the stand that he lied, Cohen, and that I never told him or anyone else to inflate the numbers. In fact, the numbers are low or very conservative, the exact opposite of what this ridiculous rigged case is all about. The fraud is by the judge and the AG, Mar-a-Lago and more, not by me. So that's Donald Trump. Now, that was before the gag order was lifted. And so we see what the before looks like. We'll see what the after looks like because now Trump is free to criticize what should be condemned, which is insane co-judging by an unqualified person who wanted to be a judge, who's made thousands of dollars of donos to Democrats, who is sitting on the same level as the judge, giving him notes, co-judging throughout the trial with her laptop literally right next to his. Now they can comment on that. The judge said, don't you talk about my GF. Don't talk about my Greenfield. Now they can. And we'll see what Trump says. We'll see what Alina says. And we'll see what the Court of Appeals says because Angeron has been ordered to respond to this, to explain himself to the Court of Appeals. And that should be fun to read through. We'll be doing that here, my friends. Thank you for joining us as we do. Thank you for subscribing to our channel and sharing it with a friend or family member, inviting them to come on over here and join us so that they can stay apprised of what is happening in these weaponized prosecutions throughout this next election. It's only going to heat up from here, and we'll be looking forward to seeing you join us as the coverage continues. And that, my friends, is it for us on the day. We covered some good ground. Anger on gets his gag order stayed. I'm sure he's very unhappy about that. We, are, we read through the full mistrial motion. He's having a bad week, okay? His, him and his GF are like just, are you doing okay, sweetie? This will all pass. I know it's going to be over soon. So uh, Fanny is now moving to revoke Harrison Floyd's bond. He feels very racist to me. And Trump has submitted his final motions to strike the inflammatory language. And I thought those were very good filings. And I enjoyed reading through those. And now, my friends, it is time to hear from you. It's time to see what you have to say about this. Of course, reminder about our friends at Field of Greens. They got a great new promo right now, Black Friday, baby. VIP is the promo code. So head on over there, use code VIP to save that 30% off on your orders on at Field of Greens. 
Com. Now, we are going over to our members only after party here in a few minutes to debrief some of the day's activities. We'd love to have you join us for our member only morning streams, our Saturday streams, our after parties, our amazing community, and much more at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. Come and join us, and we will see you over there. We also got some nice donos in the house, courtesy of our friends on the YouTubes, the Rumbles, the Locals and all across the fruited plain of the internet. V, thank you for clipping away for us on the day. Who's here? We got Jackie Peavy House in the house. What's up, Jackie Peavy House? Welcome to our channel. Welcome as a supporter. We're glad to have you on the show as a new member. Welcome into the club. And oh my goodness, look at this. Whoo! So we got some serious gifted members all coming in from Tony Hay Munkets. Look at this, Tony Hay. Shout out to Tony. So Tony Hay Munkets has like a bunch of different membos coming in. And so let's shout them out. And hey, YouTube friends, make sure you grab the Telegram link. So on the channel homepage, navigate over to the community tab, scroll, scroll, scroll. You'll see a Telegram link somewhere in there. Click that link and it's a private link so you can join us on all of the extra stuff. Uh, but the morning streams, the Saturday shows, those are all included on YouTube. We just have to do it differently for the after parties. Anyways, Tony Hay, you're the man. Bringing in Jane K, Line Theory. We got Maureen's coming in. Ian B, Dire Gnome, Alex W, Tornado Sunflowers here. Kendall Kelly, Three Girlies is coming in. Craig V, we got Maury's here. Richard Tatership is coming. John K, BJM, we have... Uh, Nikki S is coming in the house. So great. We got K Tay, Jerry C, Karen E, Maddie Adams. What's up? Marlene S all coming. Cut. Thanks to Tony Haymunkets. Some serious Membo's coming in. We also got Jason G, Texas Guitar Gal, Jerry M, Danny Law is here. Poem Pageant. All thanks to Tony Haymunkets. Man, look at all these amazing new Membo's in the house. Thank you, Tony Hay for bringing in new Membos. That's 5, 10, 15, 25 new Membos. Woo! Amazing. Tony Hay Munkets. Oh, and hey, V, clip this one. Hey, hey, we're the Munkets. Bringing in new members. Thank you. We got this one from Finn Contracting. Says Greenfield. Field of Greens? Huh. Yes, I agree with that. Greenfield? Greenfield? Feel the greens? Huh. All right. We got Fred Pedamontes here. Thank you, Finn. We got Fred Pedamonte says, oh, <laughs> oh, no, this is not good. Fred, too soon for this. Says, Johnny just ordered a paraglider. No, okay. We're not going to no, uh, uh, call, uh, I don't know, call somebody. Dolphin fan is the man, is here, says, bringing in five new Membos. What's up, Dolphin fan? Bringing in uh, JL. We got GU. We got Auntie Plode is coming in. We got Almighty Snoopy and Alicia, all gifted new Membos, courtesy of Dolphin Fan is the man in the house. Thank you very much, Dolphin, for the new Membos. And welcome. GSD Lady says, did you notice that your favorite lawyer was with Trump and Tucker at the fight and she was wearing a very special necklace? It says FJB. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, she did. She did. Yeah, she was there and... I'm not jealous or anything. I'm not mad that I wasn't there with Tucker Carlson and Dan Bongino and Donald Trump and Joe Rogan and everybody else. No, I'm not mad about it. It's like, no, it's fine. I didn't want to go to that anyways. Thanks for the invite. Anyways, we got NY says, haven't prosecutors in the past been sanctioned and even criminally charged when they file conflicting pleadings in cases that are related? Uh, I don't know if they've been criminally charged for like conflicting pleadings, but I'm sure they've had uh, some prob some problems, I'm sure. Yeah, like you could have some, you know, ethical problems. Uh, but I'm trying to think how they could they would be charged. Like, I don't, I, I'm not familiar with a case where a prosecutor has been charged with a crime for charge. Well, I mean, like the crime when char with, with charging a crime would be like malicious prosecution or something like that, right? I mean, it would be... Uh, yeah, I, I, I think not something that we're talking about here is, is where I'm going with that. Good to see you, Doc. Because th this is just Jack Smith in two different locations. These are, you know, these are separate types of, of cases according to them. J6 protesters versus Donald Trump. Barb's Loves Alaska says, 
Will President Trump get back to the get back the penalties, monies that anger uncharged him for not staying gagged prior to this stay? So he should, yeah. I mean, he should. If it was unconstitutional, that should all come back to him. Now, I don't know, you know, I don't know if that has already been delivered or if that's still being held in escrow, but yes, I mean, it was an unconstitutional order. He should get all 15,000 back instantly. Uh, Tony Hay Munkett says, someday we will have fireworks and barbecue. And you know what date I'm not allowed to say? I'd love to have fireworks and a barbecue. Yeah, I, mean, I love fireworks in general. They're pretty cool. And I love barbecues and, you know, ribs and steaks and burgers. And I like it all. I like all the barbecue food. So I'm down. We got this one from Jennifer Newman. What's up, Jennifer? Says, keep it up. Jennifer, thank you for sending it in. No comment, but you do have the keep it up pair working out. And, you know, we got we, we are going to keep it up. Thank you, Jennifer, for the nice dono. Hey, Jack Max here, who's been a membo, says, oh, brother, the media and Dems bloviating about Jenna Ellis's third hand nonsense about Trump not leaving is just pure lunacy. Whether reluctant or not, he left D.C. on Inauguration Day. Yeah, he, he, they left. There wasn't even, like, he didn't even, like, they didn't have to, like, push him. They just picked up and left. So it was all bravado, all bluster. Like, what she said didn't happen. So does that mean that the other things she say also didn't happen, right? And it's hearsay that's multiple layers removed from anything. It's wild. Jack, good to see you. Thanks for being a membo. Knox says, happy Thursday, everyone. I tell all my clients to scrub their social media if they have not already and stay off until the case resolves. Very good advice. I know this case is political, but no one loves jail baloney. You're right. You're right, Knox. And, and it's hard. It's hard. Like it's hard from a defense attorney perspective because I'm sitting here watching what, what Harrison Floyd is doing. And I'm like, oh gosh, that makes me just nervous from a defense perspective. But at the same time, it's like, if he doesn't speak out publicly, what, who's going to speak out for him, right? He's not the president. He doesn't have a huge microphone. So it, he's got to, you know, he's got to kind of come out and speak his case. I'm sure his defense attorney is just going, bro, stop. You're killing me, man. You're giving me a hard time here. Like I'm going to, I'm trying to keep you out of custody, but by the technical terms of the release conditions, you're, you're getting close, you know, you're getting very close. So it makes me nervous for him. Now we'll see. I think that the judge is pretty reasonable knock. So I'm hopeful that she gives him a little talking to and doesn't actually put him back in custody. I think that Fanny has been over, overreacting in her request. This one from MAGA Hat says, Breaking, State Bar of Arizona finds probable cause in the investigation of Kerry Lake's attorney, Brian Blem, and he expects to be disbarred. Sure. So I saw the headline on that, but I haven't looked into the actual story. And we remember Brian Blem is one of the lawyers who represented Kerry Lake. Kurt Olson was the other guy, and it sounds like they're both going to be under scrutiny. That's what happens when you defend your clients in this new America. Knox says, who sits in the clerk's seat? I've never seen a shared trial bench. A pellet is shared. A shared bench is shorter and level. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know, Knox. I don't know. So I was trying to zoom out on that. I think the judge has, I think it's empty. I mean, I think that, that so the judge, the way it's set up there is his witness is to his left. And on the right, I think it's lower over there, but I think it's empty. I think she's just seating up on his level. Like the bench just goes out and she's seated on the same level. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure that's how it looks. I'm trying to think if I've seen other angles of it. We don't see a lot of that other angle. Like they're usually in that corner when the camera turns. And so like, I'd like them to turn around like that way and see what's over there. But I'm pretty sure she's just up on the same bench. We got Spuds is here. Says, Areola of Anarchy's law clerk is beautiful. She must have been something before electricity. Before glasses. <laughs> Good to see you, Spuds. We got John McGarvey's in the house. Whoa, John. We got 20 new members, courtesy of John McGarvey. Oh my goodness, John, you are the man. Look at this. We got a lot of new members today. Man, it's going to be a lot of fun. And Tony Hayes with another one. All right, so John, look at this. We got 20 members coming in. Courtesy of John McGarvey. Thank you, John. Another great membo. Says the following. Henry back to play is here. 
Pitch Lock. We got Natasha M. Linda G. Salty's joining us. Lao Zhu is here. TJH. Beautifully inappropriate joining us. Michael R. Johnny C. Tom S. Lactonic is here. Holly K. Peter J. Scorpid Black Dragon. Ooh. We got Tripos R. Opposing Force. Jim Whitehead. We got Terry B. And Mia J. All coming in courtesy of John McGarvey. Man, thank you, John. And welcome aboard, new members. Don't forget to grab the Telegram link and the community tab section on the YouTube homepage channel. John, thank you for doing that, man. It's super fun. Lots of new members. We're excited to have you. MAGA Hat Stays says Trump 44, Biden 35, RFK 11. Here's the poll from Interactive Polls. Another one. Oh, so when RFK jumps in the race, wow, Trump's up in both. Trump's plus nine over Biden, 51 to 42 without RFK. With RFK, Trump's still up nine, 44 to 35. Wow, that's interesting. Interesting. All right, MAGA hat, thank you for that. And Tony Hay Munkets says, is bringing in 10 new Mambos, man. How amazing. We got Angie W's coming in as a Mambo, bringing in new Mambos along with Tony. Hey, thank you, Tony. Bringing in P Peng, Debbie M, Veg Bloom. We got Brandon C, J Mars here, P Pen Halligen, Rabbit Stick, Carol B, All the Marbles is here along with Gary Y. Brought in thanks to Tony Hey Muckets. Tony, you're the man, my friend. Thank you for doing that. Lots of new Mambos. That's like 35 from Tony Hey, maybe more. MAGA hat says, Joe will not be charged for classified docs. I saw that that headline was being rumored about. But um, Joe will not be charged for classified. I saw the headline, yeah. And I'm not surprised at all because why would he? I mean, it's his DOJ. It's his special counsel, you know. It's like, all right. So, <laughs> of course, they're not going to charge him, even though he wasn't the president. He didn't have declassification power. He was a senator. He had the documents in absolutely non-secure locations, even though Trump's was at Mar-a-Lago and, you know, and that whole facility was pretty secure. His was in the back of a garage for years, decades. His was also in the Penn Biden Center, which nobody was monitoring. And Trump had the opinion power, Presidential Records Act, presidential immunity to prevent him from charges, uh, 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 like ownership under the opinion clause, all sorts of stuff. They charged him, not Joe. So not a surprise at all. Tony, hey says, I was talking about a Pacific date, a specific date that you bring up all the time. And I think we will have fireworks and celebrate it in the near future. They would not allow me to say the date. Read between the lines. All right, I'm gonna try to, Tony Hay. What date do we talk about a lot here? Hmm, I don't know. I'm gonna have to read between the lines, Tony Hay, and have to come to a conclusion. But regardless, I love a good barbecue. No doubt. And Tony, thank you for that one. We got John McGarvey bringing in 10 new memos. John, you're the man. All right, we got 10 new memos coming from John. We got Carol W. Blackfoot Man is here. Tazzy Wazzy. Yannick G. Jace C. Impromise is here. John D. Jennifer Newman. Yorick and Amber P. Coming in. Courtesy of John McGarvey. Man, tons of memos today. How fun. We got, okay, so Jack Mack is here. Says... Uh, no such thing as a stupid question. True or false? No such thing as a stupid question. I don't know. It depends who I'm talking to. Um, if I'm talking to an eight-year-old, then the answer is true. Yeah, no, there's no such thing as a stupid question. That's true. Absolutely. But if I'm talking to like, I don't know, you know, a politician or something, it's like, are you stupid? How could you even think such a thing? How stupid could you be? So on that, I have to say false. So it's a context type of situation in general. You know, it depends who I'm talking to. So uh, it's a good question, Jack Mac. I don't know. We got John McGarvey says, Rob, please tell YouTube they have to accept gift memberships by clicking the package. Okay, so my friends, you have to accept your gift membo. Click the package when it pops up. So our YouTube friends, Click accept. And what's up? Tasadika is here. Tasadika is over on Locals. Says, happy Rob Day. What's up, Tasadika? Says, every day is a happy day when Rob's here to break down the nonsense. He helps the black pill turn to a shade closer to white. <laughs> we try to do what we can. We try to do what we can. You know, there's only so much we can do on that one. But, um, but Tasadika, super great to have you. 
and I'm glad that you join us. I, you know, had a ton of fun with you. And so I'm grateful that we get to do it together. And so my friends, so from John, definitely make sure you accept the package on the YouTube so that those gifts come in and you can accept them. And I think there might even be like, you might want to have to uh, turn in. Okay. I clipped accept gifts. Okay, cool. Yeah. Right on. So I think, um, I think also like if you're not getting the gifts, I think you might have to turn on a setting or something like you can accept the gifts as a YouTube setting as well. So V Antica says there's no such thing as a stupid question. There's only stupid people asking stupid questions. I mean, you know, to answer that more seriously, it's like I am somebody who likes conversation. I like the creation of knowledge. I like the exploration of ideas. And so if I had to like just pick one, I would say there's no such thing as a stupid question if I had to pick one because I'd rather have conversations about it. I'd rather somebody ask a question that maybe they didn't know, like in all, you know, in all, in all seriousness, like I've asked a lot of questions that are stupid questions, like no doubt, like all the time, right? And I, and people could easily tell me, oh, that's kind of a stupid question. Like I have a coach and all, you know, and sometimes I ask him questions. He like looks at me, he's like, that's pretty dumb. And I'm like, oh, I know. But you know, it, it's, it's about the creation of knowledge and it's about conversating. And it's, it's I think, a, a process whereby we want to incentivize people to ask questions if they don't understand something without being made to feel like they're idiots, right? In general. But sometimes people are willfully ignorant and sometimes people are maliciously ignorant and we can't tolerate that crap either. So anyways, so good question, and Jack. Thank you for that one. And John, thanks for the reminder to accept the gifts on the tubes. Okay, now let's pause for a moment and say hello to our friends on X and see who is joining us over there before we wrap it up and go over to our members only after party and see who is joining us over there. Who's joining us on the Telegram, on the uh, uh, X platform where we're at? Oh, my, th my feed was all discombobulated. Nine viewers, man, whoo! That's under double digits, but it's okay. I'm gonna just cry myself to sleep tonight, not a big deal. Fred says, Trump seriously needs to start Xing right now. Trump seriously needs to start Xing right now. Says True Social is not going to cut it. Uh, Danny says Rob's not going to be on tomorrow night. It's all it'll all be over soon. We'll be on tomorrow morning. Okay, so we'll be back here tomorrow morning, a little bit earlier as a reminder. So we're going to do an early show, probably nine Eastern time in the morning, nine Eastern time, provided there's stuff to talk about. I'm going to get up early and try to figure out and slap together a show. We'll see if there's anything to talk about. It's going to be so early. It's like, there's, is there any news? I don't know. Uh, here, uh, George says, Joe kept classified documents in Hunter's garage and said, wow, that's a gaggle of gags. Crazy big fanny. We got Knight says, great work. Old drill sergeant is here. Thomas D. Murphy says, is Rob wanting to get into, into discussions regarding President Trump being a lawyer? Well, yeah, we're talking a lot about him, no doubt. Okay, so my friends, that is our X account over on, you can follow us at Rob Govea ESQ right there. That is the address. We also have a Watching the Watchers community on X and we're still waiting for Elon to figure out exactly what we're doing with this whole thing, but we do have a community there. We are congregating here and it's a great way to connect with other people. Follow other watchers out there so you can you know, like their stuff and we can support each other when we're out there in the wild on the X platform. So check it out, watching the watchers, the group, or follow me on X. And we'll of course be populating that when we figure out exactly what to do with it, but that's where we're hanging. And so my friends, that is gonna be it for us on the day. We are going over to watchingthewatchers.locals.com for our members only after party. We would love, love to see you there. We have a great community there. We do after parties, member only streams. We'll do a Saturday stream in the morning. And so come check us out. We also have robertgovea.com. You can access the stories, the segments that we talk about. We call them reports there. The PDFs are there. You can access the mind map there. Lots of good stuff. Before we wrap it up, want to say what's up to our mods and our meme smiths who mod down the fort for us and keep things oh so nice and orderly. Our friends Vienticus Prime, K Bean, we got Just Cause, we got Playin' Hooky, our friend Ronnie Cole, we got Zulu, Beyond Geo, Zach Nichols, John Allen, our friend Janek, 909 Dog Digger, and Donut Mind Me, along with Sleepy Dog Lee, our meme smith, Gigum Gigum, 
and Nathan N810 in the house, all making the place nice and beautiful. And of course, we had one final dono come in from our friend over on Rumble called 1R5. Said J6 had over a million Trump supporters. 1,200 is closer to 0 to 0.01%, far less than 1%. Let's never forget. Yeah, it was a tiny fraction of the people that were there. And they, they have tried to smear on uh, uh, 80 million people for a small fraction of people who were caught up in something, probably instigated by federal agents shooting projectiles at them and instigating them, if not setting them up outright to go into the building. So it feels like much more like an op. If you, have, if you put this all on a spectrum and you set a legitimate insurrection on one end or a planned government op on the other end, where would you put yourself on that spectrum? Well, you know, like a video, hey, where do you, uh, uh, insurrection or uh, planned, you know, government op. I'm much closer to the planned government op, right? Clearly, because it's, it's not even remotely close to seizing power in American democracy. The people who say that are nuts. So thank you, 1R5, for the nice dono. That is going to be it for us on the day. And so we are going to leave it there, my friends. We will come back tomorrow again. We're planning on an early show. It might not be right at 9 a.m. Eastern time, depending on what the news looks like. We'll try to squeeze it all in. might be a little bit later, but we'll see. It's going to be a beautiful Friday. We are going to wrap up the week nice and strong, and I hope you're doing the same, making it a great week and getting out there, getting after whatever you're getting after. But we will be back tomorrow in the morning to get to it again, and we need to see you right back here so that together with your help, we can shine that big, beautiful spotlight of accountability and transparency down upon our system with the hope of finding justice. Make it a beautiful night, my friends. Sleep very well. I'll see you right back here tomorrow. Bye-bye.